And it goes on to say, Joram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. He passed away to no one's regret and was buried in the city of David, but not in the tomb of the kings. He wasn't even given a king's burial because he was such a punk and such a uh, uh, hater of God and the ways of God, and he wouldn't simply humble himself as King David did after he committed murder. First he committed adultery, and then he committed murder, and then he tried to cover it up. All these things happened, and he humbled himself. The 51st Psalm tells about King David's remorseful heart and the great outpouring of his soul as he reaches out to God and says, I'm so sorry for what I've done. And 400 years after David, God says, I'm still not going to destroy Judah for the sake of my servant David. I mean, if you humble yourself before the Lord and you ask for forgiveness, he's going to forgive. This guy didn't, and out comes his bowels, and he didn't get any king's burial. Israel. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his presence. Only the tribe of Judah was left, and even Judah did not keep the commands of the Lord their God. They followed the practices Israel had introduced. Therefore the Lord rejected all the people of Israel. He afflicted, the, afflicted them and gave them into the hands of the plunderers until he thrust them from his presence. The northern tribes of Israel didn't pay attention to God. They rejected him. They, they said, we're going to do our own thing. We're going to create our own holy days and our own priests and all this stuff. And eventually God wore out trying to send them prophets to turn them back to him. And he thrust them from his presence. And what does it say about Judah? This is a little later in the in years after Israel was exiled. It says Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. His mother's name was Hamutal, daughter of Jeremiah. She was from Libna. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord just as Jehoiakim had done. It was because of the Lord's anger that all this happened to Jerusalem and Judah. And in the end... He thrusts them from his presence. First Israel gets thrust from his presence, and then Judah. And out goes Judah into exile for 70 years to Babylon. Now, eventually they were brought back from exile because God had a plan and a purpose for the people of the world to bring the Messiah through Judah to the world, and that is Jesus Christ. After they rejected him, after seeing God incarnate, they were thrust from his presence again in 70 AD and exiled all around the world. Now God has graciously brought them back because of his holy name, because of the people that bear his name, though they haven't called on him, he has graciously brought them back into the land. And we are to support Israel because they are God's people in that land for a special purpose. And the purpose of the ages will be fulfilled through them. And they are back there by his divine uh, command. And so we are not to fight against that command, but to support them. Our administration currently is not doing that. And in fact, they're belligerent to him. And it's very, very sad how our administration has treated the people of Israel and the leaders of Israel in recent months. And we will be judged for that. And guess what? We will be thrust from his presence if we don't simply turn around and acknowledge that God is sovereign and that his choices stand. Whether we like it or not, whether we like the, this group of people or that group of people or whatever, we're fighting against God. We do not want to do that or he will thrust us from his presence. Then the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah the prophet, Listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you. You have persuaded this nation to trust in lies. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to remove, from you, remove you from the face of the earth. This very year you are going to die because you have preached rebellion against the Lord. In the seventh month of that same year, Hananiah the prophet died. He was fighting against Jeremiah saying, This is going to happen. And Jeremiah said, No, this is going to happen. Well, eventually the Lord substantiated Jeremiah's word by having this person died. Now, Jeremiah said, this is gonna happen within a year, you're gonna die. And this guy, Hananiah, could have said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful for my life and I'm going to repent and I guarantee you that the Bible would have recorded a different outcome. The Lord relented from destroying him, but he didn't. And he died that year, thrust from God's presence, whether a tree falls to the north or to the south, in the place where it falls, there it will lie. And he's lying on the bad side right now because he failed to acknowledge his creator and his just decisions. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table at the 12. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. Well, they all had dipped their hand into the bowl with him. This is what they did is they dipped into this bowl and they ate this, this stuff at the Passover meal. So they know that somebody in that room is going to be uh, betray him. And they also know that it's somebody that has actually dined with him. It may have been that there were people in the room that didn't dine with him. I don't know. But all we can say with absolute certainty is it was somebody that was actually having a meal with him. And when you invite somebody in your home and you have a meal with them, that is a sign of real familiarity. 
not even to speak that they've been walking with him all those years. And this person, Jesus said, is going to betray him. And what does it say here? The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus said, Yes, it is you. Now, Judas had a couple choices. He could have said, You know what? I'm not going to do this thing. Or I'm going to go ahead and follow through with it. And guess what? He chose a stupid decision. And whether a tree falls to the north or to the south, where it falls, there it will lie. And that is where the tree lay. He could have repented, and he didn't. It says here, um, In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judah, Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our numbered and shared in his ministry. All right? So, David knew that this was going to happen. He prophesied that, that uh, Jesus would be betrayed. People say, well, then Judas isn't really culpable. He was given free will. God simply knew what that free will was before he made it. It's like our prayers. Our prayers do not change God's mind, but if we don't make them, God knew that we wouldn't make them and he doesn't respond. All right? Same thing. If we do pray, then our prayers would have been known before time was created that they would occur. And so that's what happens is God responds to our prayers before the creation. Judas knew that, or I'm sorry, God knew that Judas would betray Jesus before he was ever created. And this is the way that these things work. It doesn't negate culpability. Judas is culpable. We cannot go writing books about how Judas was innocent or, or he is actually a hero in God's economy or any crazy thing like that. The guy betrayed the Son of Man and woe to him. With the reward he got for his wickedness, speaking of Judas, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this. So they called that field in their language, Akeldama. That is, field of blood. Okay, uh, Judas hung himself. And then in the account in Acts, it says that he uh, fell headlong into a ditch and he, his, he burst open and his gut spilled out. There's no contradiction in the two. If he hung himself, it was over a Passover week and nobody would have wanted to have touched him or they would have been unclean and they wouldn't have been able to celebrate the Passover. And so what did they do? They just cut the rope. He fell down into this gully or whatever. A rock probably hit his bloated stomach and out comes his intestines. He got what he deserved because he had rejected the word of the Lord and because he was wicked from the beginning. He was an evil person and he was judged because of it. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it and may another take his place of leadership. Judas was given a place of leadership along with all of the apostles. I'm sorry, my phone keeps ringing. I forgot to turn it off. Judas uh, uh, had a place of leadership and he forfeited it. He forfeited it for quick gain and in the end, he is condemned to eternity in hell because he rejected the Son of Man. Whether a tree falls to the north or to the south, in the place where it falls, there he will lie. There it will lie. It says here, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? You know, the book of Matthew records that they both belittled Jesus on the cross. Obviously, at some point, this one criminal realized there's something extraordinary about Jesus Christ. And instead of continuing to belittle him, he starts reflecting on his own sinful nature. And he says, I'm a sinful man. This man has done nothing. How he came to that epiphany, we don't know. We're not told in the, the Bible, but he did. And he said, don't you fear God? Listen, this guy's done nothing. We're being judged because of what we've done, but he's done nothing. It goes on to say, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Whether a tree falls to the north or to the south, in the place where it falls, there it will lie. And some things are inevitable. Water in a cloud is going to come out of the cloud. When it gets heavy enough, it's just going to rain. And this guy knew that he was going to die. It was inevitable. And so he chose which direction he would fall. And he fell into the arms of Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Redeemer, the God who loved him so much that he hung on a cross right next to him, this filthy criminal. And guess what? He was the first person to enter the kingdom of God after Christ's death 